I'm, I'm Charlie uh, Bessie, and uh, I'm happy to be here. I actually went to Slick here about uh, 2006, um, before I went up to the University of Utah, and I valued my time here immensely. Um, just a real big, clar big clarification, um, my company, Koala Tree, is not at those numbers. Um, I was at Skull Candy when, I went, when they went from 5 million to 125 million. Um, so I had to, that'll hit on one of my really strong points when you're in the development stages, which is using somebody else's money to learn, <laughs> to learn the industry and to build contacts. Um, but so, so my company right now is still in the smaller stages. Um, we have, you know, been teetering with the million dollar in sales line for about two years now. Um, and we, our company just went through our, uh, our first sell and a successful, my first personal successful sell. Um, where I was hands-on involved and we got a new group of partners that we can really strategize and, and lock down some key ingredients for the brand to move forward to hit, hit those numbers. But we'll touch on that, but just yeah, so sp specifically, I don't stand here with the company that I personally ra you know, raised to 25 million in sales, but one day. Um, but one thing that I, that I wanted to do too is because that helped me throughout my process um, of talking with you guys. I have uh, 12, over 12 years of experience in my industry specifically um, fashion and entertainment and it's each industry especially when you're talking about a startup will be tailored specific to what those needs are but they'll generally always fit a platform um, so I think we have enough time to I just wanted to um, if we can I, I assume that each one of you guys has an interest in either working for somebody or being a part of your own startup um, it be you know in, in incorporating what you've learned here in the business school. So if you guys have any interest, or if there is anybody here that has something specifically that's a business they know they want to be involved with or start with in an industry, um, we can just start up here. And if you want, if you don't want, don't have one, then that's fine. But if you do, it'll help me give a better idea to relate to you, um, so that if I can you know help you even more so in what you're trying to do, um, then then I'm happy to do that. Have a little bit more of a specific guidance for the people in this room. Um, so. <coughs> yeah, so my, my company, sorry, I should have said that, is, uh, is apparel and accessories for the outdoor action sports um, lifestyle industries. So some of our competitors would be compared to so, um, Topo Design, Polar, uh, polar Stuff, um, you know, more well-known ones, Brixton, Vans, uh, et cetera. So the type of avenues and stores we've been wi working with is from backcountry to Tilly's and Zoomies and so forth. Yes, yeah, so that's a that's an absolutely great question. With my specific industry, we have we've been in eight different countries, um, Japan being a very strong market for us, and the the number one problem with that that I see is brands coming in and kind of jumping onto the international market as a startup before they should be there. So for us, we we didn't maximize what our brand was in the U.S before entering into Canada, Ita you know, Italy, um, Japan. And we saw, we got caught up in that mix of like being excited about those companies coming to us rather than looking at the contract. You know, much as like, I feel like athletes, when you start getting people interested in, in you and you don't really necessarily look at the fine print, because uh, what, the, what the distributors will do is they'll take your margins of wholesale and then they'll take 30% off of that. So a lot of what you'll use international distributors in, in my industry for is to help meet your MOQ. So if I need 500 denim and to meet my MOQ and I only have sold 300 pairs in the US, my international distributors can get me up to that number. Um, but in essence, that, that isn't really f um, making me my margins in, in, in equity and in profit. So, Working with distributors for us, when I got in, after this sale, when I got in and looked at the numbers and took that, that category back over, we weren't making any money on our international distributors. And, we, and probably 60% of our time was going towards that as a group of five people. So it just didn't make any sense. Um, so with international distribution, I would, I would make sure that you have the brand power and or, or, and or the product that you can negotiate with them on your terms. Um, there's a company, Ace Camp, out of here in Utah, and they, they told me a really nice process that we're actually going to implement now is letting our international distributors work directly with our factories. 
over, you know, so that way it avoids our product going from China to the U.S. to Japan, and then it allows us to not put so much time into investing into it anymore, but still have the brand growing in Japan. Yeah. Oh. I'll go. Okay. You asked if we have any desires to build our own. Is that what you're? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just specifically like what your what your interests are. So that was a great a great question and. Honestly, one that cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars to learn that, that lesson. Um, and if you impl implement a smart strategy, that's why I really hit on that, because that's, that's one of the top ingredients for success is in a business. But if you guys have a tailored industry, I can you know, try and hit on that as I'm, as I'm talking about how I came up and what I've done. Well, first of all, I have a Koala Tree shirt. I really like it. <laughs> um, Thank you. But something that I've, I've toyed a lot with and kind of have an interest in is, is learning and starting a welding company, like, or just maybe just doing it kind of free. <coughs> I think that's impactful. Yeah, that's awesome. One of our ambassadors, he went from a pro skier to now he's a full-time welder. And the market here is incredible for furniture and welding and all the different ad, ad, like avenues. So I can definitely hit on that, that ingredient specifically. And then anybody else have any specific industries? Okay. Cool. Well, what I'm going to do is just kind of give a basis ground for, um, I'm just kind of going to assume that everybody here is going to, you know, my, my passion is entrepreneurship and startups. So that's really the grittiness that I'm going to get into. Um, and what I learned and what cost me a, a lot of time and energy and, and um, you know, what, I, what I'm excited about doing moving forward now that I've learned those things. Um, one of the main things I think when you, you, you know, and you give me a little bit of history on, on me is um, I graduated in 2004. Um, when I graduated, I had a, a couple of successful companies. Um, nothing crazy, it was in landscaping, but I saw a niche in, in lawn aerating and I went out and um, built a company and, and, and just felt, that's when I fell in love with, with seeing the, the, uh, something from an idea to fruition and, and making it happen, as well as employing other people and then making people in the community happy um, and having a face with the community. So those two ingredients for me is what got me started in wanting to start companies and, and be involved in, in uh, making my work my life. And, uh, so, so the two things there is, for me was, was having a, a sense of, of, of being engaged with the community. I loved that, you know, having a, you know, had the fact that the grocery store owner, I grew up in Centerville, Utah, the fact that the gro grocery store owner you know, was the friendly guy that waved to everybody and knew everybody and was, was helping bring good, good produce and good things to the community. Um, I loved that, and when I was doing my, offering my services, um, I saw that same passion of helping people and um, as well as employing people and giving people jobs that wouldn't have had that opportunity before. Um, and so every company that I, that I personally founded and was involved with, I wanted to have a give back and have a purpose because for me, having a way to give back to the community, um, that allowed me to, to keep working at the, the late nights and the, and the hard hours that it takes to, to get something out there. Um, so with my, with my, you know, after, after I graduated, I came here to Solid Community College and took uh, a scholarship with, with them to still do my entrepreneur stuff, but then have a, a you know, a foundation to learn more um, here. So I, I majored in sociology and I loved, the, you know, learning more about people, places, and things to be able to take my concepts and know who to market them to. Because before then, I was just, you know, it was door-to-door -door sales, or I was just kind of out um, throwing a dart at the wall and hoping it would work. Um, after the, after the um, landscape companies, I went on to found a company that where we did um, video production and concert promotions and concert productions. So that one was, a, that one's where I lost a, lot, I lost a lot of sleep and a lot of money, but gained a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge. Um, that one was, you know, where I feel like I, I really threw a lot of darts at the wall. You're bringing, in, you're bringing in artists, you're bringing in people that you're a personal fan of, and then sometimes that just doesn't strike the market of where you're at. And your opinion isn't going to be one where um, that is what decides if a concert sells out or if it doesn't. Um, 
And so I spent a lot of time doing market research, trying to understand my demographic more and where to market to the specific demographic that was that was there. So if I had, you know, a hip hop concert, then I knew to go to certain certain demographics and spots to promote that or have it in certain magazines and and uh, and started to kind of teeter with that, which is a very important thing to do with a startup. And you can do it so much easier now with social media too. Social media can save you so much money and so much time with going out and finding your marketplace and kind of letting it build itself organically. Um, so after I, after I left the, uh, the, the concert promotion company, I ended up getting hired for, for, by Skullcandy um, because of that promotion company and getting infused in there to set up deals with artists for headphones and to get people wearing headphones as they came in um, and played and so forth. And then that turned into a full-time job and I sold the, the, my shares in the concert promotion company and moved on to work for Skullcandy full-time. Um, I, try, I worked here at, at Slick for, or I, I went to school here at Slick for about six months while I was up at Skull Candy, and then it got to the point where I was traveling so much that I had to make that decision of staying in school or going to take up this opportunity to be one of the first employees at a, a company that I, I believed in and had, had legs. Um, and that's where I would say I, I, I grew and learned the most. Um, when you're when when you're young, and that's where that's where you know one of the, she said about five five key points um, to kind of hit on, and one of those is going to be um, not not going into it blind as far as starting a company. I talk with so many different people, and um, I do a lot of consulting, and and my first thing is to go work for somebody else in that industry if you haven't had that, that, that time and that um, opportunity to, to make, make contacts and to really understand and grow your market under somebody else's dollar. Um, that's so, that really is so important. I see people that, that, that have done that and they have went and put the time in, be so much more successful. Um, and in my industry especially, it's because people don't do business with businesses. They do business with people. Um, now that's not the case in every industry, but in, in my industry, 100% that is the case. You know, I fought tooth and nail, for example, to get our some of our products that I knew were technically and and uh, fashion-wise perfect fit for outside magazine. Um, I tried for four, about four years, and they wanted you know they wanted us to buy in. They wanted ten thousand um, dollars for these features, and I ended up running into somebody at the outdoor retailer show that was a gear, gear rider for them. And, um, you know, we talked, we related. He loved what we were doing as far as our sustainable initiative. And um, then we just kept that, that relationship open. And the next time he came up, he ended up staying at my house because they were low on budget and he wanted to be there for a couple extra days. And I got him a bunch of product. We we talked. We you know we built on that relationship more. And since that point, we've had two write-ups in Outside Mag that have. I mean, for a small brand, when you get, you know, hundreds of thousands of people looking at your product, that basically you know they you know Outside Mag is a very legit outlet. It, it was huge, and that was all built off relationships. And we could have went out and you know tried to spend the 20 grand to get us there, but instead one relationship that we nurtured. Um, you know, got us, got us th that that outcome. Um, so, so when you're when you are working with other people, I feel like you can you can either look at your salary or what you're getting monetary wise from it. Um, but for me, I was never looking at that. I always looked at how how who can I learn from, how can I grow, what mentors can I have here. Um, and so I really went into this situation out of college. Um, with the mindset of what knowledge can I get? Who, who can I learn from and grow from? And I, I developed some incredible mentors from that that I still uh, work with today. Um, one of them is the, the owner of Traeger Grills right now. The other one um, founded Stant Socks and is doing that. And so as a small company, when I have questions and I can go to those guys still, it's, it's been a major outlet that, that you can't put a price, price amount on. So so many people want to go straight to market, straight to doing their own thing, and they almost see working for somebody else as a steps backwards. But that's the number one thing that I think can get you ahead um, in that avenue. And so when I was when I was at Skullcandy, I I mean I really I really 
utilized the maximum potential to use their resources to, to grow my own, my own value, um, no matter where I left from there. Um, I think that one of the main things that I learned there is that internally, things might not ever make sense with smaller brands and startups. You know, you kind of fake it till you make it type, type model. Um, and for me to see that, that was really good. There was one specific week where, you know, we were at, we were at 2 million in sales. Um, we'd just gotten into Best Buy and Circuit City. I mean, we, we, th things were looking good. Um, but on the back end, we couldn't make payroll. You know, and so some of the investors came in and put another amount into the company to be able to make payroll, and that was that was right when I was was hired on. Um, but that I still remember that feeling and that that scariness that everybody had. Um, houses were on the line. You know, there was a lot riding on the six the next wave of success for the brand, and. Uh, the energy in there was raw, you know. It was like if somebody we, if somebody went and put everything on red in, in Las Vegas, and um, you know we worked our butts off from that point on for the next couple of months to m make our presence known in those big boxes. I even remember some of the owners um, sending money to their family members in different states to go to Best Buy and just buy out the headphones so they could, you know. And that's a strategy that that a lot of, of retailers use, kind of to get. Their, their brand sell through in the beginning, um, kind of off the ground. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the nice thing about that was that we all became friends and we all grew together from that experience, it experience because it wasn't your normal nine to five. It was like, it was, it was a lot of the, the, you know, the shakiness of how are we going to get paid this week to take care of our own things. Um, the fun thing is, out of that group of 10 people, now most of us have our own companies. Um, one of them is, is Wolfgang. They're a, they're a dog leash accessory company here. Um, the other one, Jeremy, is doing Traeger grills. Um, but I feel like that energy is what we've, all of us have the, in that group, we're chasing from that point on. And that's why we all own our own companies now. And, and you know, we have been able to kind of move on and do the same thing that we did there with other opportunities. Um, because then you see that, you see that shakiness. And then the next thing you know, one year later, um, our brand was at like $75 million in sales. And so you you know you see that retail market work that when you set up a good infrastructure a good base you have a good product um, you see that you have to take you really do have to take those risks um, because it's a cash flow forward industry but if you believe in what you're doing and you have the team that believes in what they're doing um, it was fun for me to see that pay off and and I've seen that in in Neff I've seen that in a fair amount of other companies that I've been involved with. Um, so when I when I left when I left Skull Candy, I went on and started doing that exact thing for other companies and 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 going in and um, consulting for them and stealing that fire of the attitude that they can do it um, and that they can make it happen. I think that's the scariest thing for for startups um, is when you get an individual that's really really talented at what they do, but they can't get past that there are problems every day. That it is, it is chaotic. Um, it's it's not it's not your your nine to five, and that's why it ties back to having my businesses be involved in a community give back. That was something that at Skull Candy they didn't do um, to the to the point that they they could have, and I saw the abilities of what they how they could have impacted communities, and I wanted to do that with anything that I did moving forward. Um, so when I when I put in those late hours, what Koalatry does is we give back to um, different farms, different third world countries to feed, um, to, to support community farms um, that feed those communities and are changing the way that they're living by teaching them how to grow. Um, we've, we, we give away the, our, our grow bags, which we've given away around 10,000 of them and promote to grow in, in city life and in urban settings and, and um, do growing clinics and, and teach kids how to grow. And it's been exciting, you know, over this last six years to have people come up to me or to have um, different, different people through, through one avenue, because there's so many different walks of life that are the quality consumer, 
Um, but to have them come to me and say that they have been growing for two years and they grow most of their food during the summer um, because of koala tree. And that's, that's the type of things that through the hard road have kept me working, um, you know, the late nights and making, making it happen to push through it. Um, and I wouldn't have, I don't think I would have ever had that um, forward sight as far as the, 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 um, the hard work paying off forward if I wouldn't have been at, that, at Skull Candy and seen that. Um, and been at other companies consulting and seen the opposite. Um, so, so with that said, I, get, I got off on a tangent, but back to, the, back to uh, um, having, having somebody that has a great talent and just doesn't, can't see past those problems, it will, it will kill the brand. Um, and everyone finds themselves doing that, but when you can kind of go shake it off and see the positive through the situation and, and, a, and a solution, um, a really great, a really great on, a mentor and entrepreneur told me that it, he tells his employees that to not come to them with a problem unless they have two solutions, and it could be it could be stupid solutions, but as long as there's a solution, then you can work from something. But if somebody just comes to you with the problems, and they're always coming to you with problems, everyone in the company is going to see that, everyone's going to start feeling that, and you're going to start feeling this wave of can't do it, and. Um, that's what I really, really, f the main thing that I saw when I started moving into consulting for companies is I didn't understand how, how great that was that Skull Candy had that from the beginning. Um, the, the people that stayed there that worked, um, you know, because it, as a startup, some, sometimes you have a lot of hot turnover because people think they can work for equity or X, Y, and Z and then end up having obligations. Um, but those of us that stayed, we, we really stayed positive and we saw the opportunities um, and we, we built off the opportunities and off of what we were doing that was successful while acknowledging the problems that were going on with solutions. Um, and that keeps, everybody, that keeps everybody communicating, it keeps everybody taking responsibility and it, takes everybody, it keeps everybody moving forward. And when you only have so few bodies, those are such key ingredients and if one of those is missing, then you're not going to have any communication and or people that want to communicate and then that's when blaming and placing you know others at fault comes in pointing fingers and then you have this great thing with nobody wanting to work together and when everyone's in when you have that happen with people being equity owners that destroys brands that that absolutely kills this kills the company and and it and it it it, it can go as far as to just absolutely destroy lives um, and so I think that's the, that's the main thing for, for me is when you're, when you're going into work for somebody or you're going into to work with partners or set up a company is really dig into who you're working for and who you're working with. Um, I've had ones where I didn't do my, my background checks on possible partners and things came out of the wood, woodworks and it really is like a marriage, you know, or somebody that, that you're working for that you're trying to learn from and the main value is learning from them and, and um, you know, not the paycheck, then you're not gonna be happy there because what you're learning is, you're constantly gonna be frustrated with what you're learning if your morals don't line up with and values with what the company or the people you're working with or who, who for <coughs> do. And uh, that'll kill, for me, that'll kill anything um, quicker than, than uh, then lighting it on fire is by having people come to me and, and constantly you know, beat you up with problems and what won't work. Um, so an, anybody that starts up a company, I'd recommend that highly to not just get excited about talking with a buddy or talking with somebody about an idea and then trying to start a company from that. Um, you really want to dig into to who they are um, and I mean even go as far, I had such a bad experience one time that I do a background check on on it, you know, because there's there was one situation where it was really ugly, um, and I want to avoid that from now on. So that's the that's the main thing that I that I learned that my dad tried to teach me. Different people tried to teach me, but you get this idea with somebody and you think they're going to help you reach your dreams and maximize it, and and it can put you you know into a bad place if you don't listen to your gut, um, and. Um, I mean, as far as as far as the consulting, that's where I really really saw that with companies. Whether it was Creative Labs, that was a two billion dollar company, or um, you know Siege Audio that was here in Salt Lake, the 
the negative attitudes were, were there, and when, when they were there and strong, um, it, it would cripple companies. And, and so uh, my motto is slow to hire and quick to fire. Um, it sucks, and it's always crappy firing somebody, but when you see that, that negative attitude come into play, um, my goal is to acknowledge it and to, to talk with them and to give them plenty of opportunities and chances. But um, you know, if you let that go on too long, you'll see it spread throughout your whole company or your whole partnership. Um, so I think that's, that's a big, big point that I've learned from. And I didn't lose money on that lesson. I just lost sanity. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's definitely, it is a marriage, a business partnership. Um, so when I was doing the consulting, I, I, I loved it. I learned a lot. Um, but I didn't get to help the community, I felt like, in a direct way. Um, I was helping companies grow. And that was great, but I didn't see the opportunity to help have enough clientele to only help companies that were giving back. Um, you know, this was kind of around the time that Tom's had, had launched um, and some other companies that were doing some strong give backs that were being received well. Um, and so one of my clients that I, that I ended up meeting up at the University of Utah and, and um, agreeing to work with was uh, my partner at Koala Tree. And his idea was to do clothing and um, to have an outlet where we could, pr you know, we could do all organic and eco-friendly uh, clothing and promote sustainability. And also through that, though, promote that it's not just what you put on your body and, you know, recycling stuff that's actually just, you know, we see as plastic. Um, but also the, f the food epidemic um, and bringing that into it as well. And, um, T talking about how you can grow your own food and um, promoting in an industry that we loved, action sports and, and entertainment and outdoors, um, you know, to, to grow your own food and to, to watch, watch and eat a little bit healthier, you know, to have a coconut water and a sandwich instead of a Carl's Jr. and a Red Bull at a skateboard event, you know? So we, we, we went around and we raised our own food on our farm. The concept was to raise our own food on a farm and to, although the that wasn't profitable, to really have it be so out there that people would listen and we would take that food and deliver it to shops, athletes, um, and events around the world. Um, so we, we started that off and we went, we'd go to events like South by Southwest, um, Lollapalooza, um, and so forth, and barbecue for hundreds and thousands of people and promote that this was from our farm and that, um, you know, that we're a sustainable clothing brand and this is our, this is our you know, our marketing and our promotion to, to what, to what we're, we're, we're working towards as a group of people. Um, and the, the, that concept is what I fell in love with and decided to leave the consulting and jump on board with him as a partner full time. Um, we went out and moved out to Colorado and started that that, that initiative of, of building the farm up and starting a, a clothing line um, a simultaneously that was based on those same sustainable initiatives. Um, at the time that we went in, there was only three factories in the world that did um, organic and recycled materials as a fabric mill on a large scale. Um, now there's over hundreds, which is awesome. It shows you how the market has trended and, and what's um, what's happening in our, in our global world, which is, which is awesome, a lot more awareness and, and a lot more of a, of a market for those products that, that, that are um, sustainable. sustainable. Um, and I've went over to, to, to a lot of those factories and the, you know, to see the changes and to see the, the initiatives that these factories are doing is incredible. Um, but but at when when we were starting this initiative, there wasn't that there wasn't that awareness at all. And so we we sat with the concept, trying to figure out how do we how do we promote what we're doing, but not sound not sound um, angry. And 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 it came down to this: in, um, promoting and working for, for something as a as a group of people or as a company or as a message, rather than against something. Um, and we saw such a massive improvement in people's receptiveness to what we were what we were doing in our message. Um, a good an example of that is is um, you know 
some friends went on a tour and they called it um, the, the anti-Monsanto Monsanto tour. And, uh, you know, the, and I went out to their stop at Red Rocks and it was a great thing and it, all around it was great. But I, what I noticed is that people's attitudes when you're fighting against something, it, it becomes very aggressive and very niche. Whereas when you're fighting for something and you're, you, you take the solution of that problem and fight for the solution and promote that rather than the problem, you'll get a lot broader um, support. And, and, and I think with any company that does do a give back, that's the struggle to find is you might be promoting something that's a problem in the world, but um, promote the solutions to that problem and not necessarily the problem in and of itself. Um, I've seen companies do both, and and bands, and um, you know PR firms, and the ones that are really promoting what you can do to solve the problem. And for us, that was grow your own food. Um, you know, use you know know what you're purchasing, and know what you're putting on your body. And if you can purchase items that are out of recycled materials and organic materials, then you know be be a conscious um, consumer and do that. What our goal was is to prov provide those those aspects at a price point that a college kid or you know a younger adult could afford. So the T-shirt that you have might be out of recycled X-ray film um, or lunch trays, uh, or we do beer bottles from from sports games, um, and then some of the other materials that we use are recycled coffee ground grounds that are like odor-proof, moisture-wicking, heat-insulated. Um, and then the x-ray film and lunch trays, they're recycled, they're recycled PET1, and so they're dry wick, they dry fit, moisture wicking. Um, so in essence, they don't, they, they last longer, they, 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 they uh, aren't going to make you feel trapped like cotton will and be super hot. Um, so, so this fact that you can combine recycled materials with performance enhancing abilities and a longer quality product, that wasn't available back, you know, six years ago. But the fact that we can support that and grow with the industry in doing that, it's been, it's we've seen much more success, um, you know, rather than trying to promote something that we're that we're against. Um, so, as far as with with quality as we started developing it, um, you know, in the apparel industry, I knew that it was it's a it's a pretty tough industry. It's a it's one of one of the hardest, that and farming are two of the hardest industries. So I knew that, that there might be a slim chance of success for us, um, but I, I just asked myself the question of, if this failed, would I still be happy with what I did with it and the people that I reached through it? And the answer was yes. So I decided to, 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 to go on board and to move out of, out of Utah to Colorado. and. Um, I kept going back to that question several times through the startup because there's times that you can't, there's times that you can't, you know, pay yourself. And there was times where, um, you know, I found myself promoting a healthy lifestyle, but when my garden wasn't producing, I'm eating, um, you know, a 99 cent meal. <laughs> Not really a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but it might as well have been. But you know, there's, there's sacrifices. And, and when you, for me, when I could hit back on that point and um, go back to, uh, having a passion for for what I was providing for the community outside of my product, then it, it always it always kept it going for me, um, and that's been that's been an, an awesome thing in developing the the brand and the key demographic, um, and and then moving moving forward with that, uh, anytime you do if you do do a give back, the shorter the the explanation and the shorter that the that the um, cause you know the direct give back to the cause is the better. For us, the farm was a big, it was a big storytelling thing. It was very hard to cover all the points, and um, it it was nice because it kind of got the uh, industry that's hard to get into to to really listen to us and say, wait, what are these guys in Colorado doing? <coughs> um, but it wasn't sustainable for us, and so we, we've we've actually gotten it out of the model, and now we're going directly to giving back through community gardens, which is good. we've seen a, such a better response because people now know what it's going to. Um, the farm was great, and it but it, it didn't it it was too complicated, and it was too many dots to get to the end story. So so now what I like a good brand to look at that does it is Listen Headphones. Um, they give back hearing to third world countries. It's pretty, it's pretty incredible. It's an amazing cause. 
Um, a lot of these people haven't heard they for you know with, for 20 years or ever, and they'll with with the technology with uh, hearing aids they can go in and, and help these people hear again. And then Proof does the same thing with vision. Um, Proof Eyewear, an eyewear company. Um, and then Ten Tree, they give back uh, Ten Trees for every product that's purchased. So the, we were seeing these companies have much more success than we were with with their social media following and their give back, because it was so just, it was so easily um, explained and and so it was so see through. Um, and f for us, it, it, the farm didn't provide that. So now. The fact that you can order something from our site and it'll go, you know, a per percentage will go back to a community garden. Um, the, the closest one to that zip code that we're working with, we feel we'll have a lot more um, success in just telling our initiative. Um, and that was a mistake that we, ma that we made, it was overcomplicating the, the give back. Um, and as I've talked several people through through give back programs for their company, that's a, that seems to be a pretty common theme for people is is overcomplicating it um, on 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 how they tell the public. Um, I also I also have a company that I'm involved with that's a, a Thai company, um, and that one's been a lot of fun in just kind of getting getting asked to jump on board on a project and not have to lose sleep over it. Um, so, so for me, I think that's one thing when you're building a company to look forward to is whether you're successful at that company or not successful, it's going to, there really are going to be opportunities that, that down the line, um, come up to be involved in, in projects and be partners in projects, um, when you have that expertise and you have a reputation where you're, you're, you're fun to work with, you keep people positive, um, and you, you know, you, you the main thing is, is for me is attitude and if you always have the attitude that you can keep the ball moving forward with a smart practical business mindset too that you're not obviously you know going into the red constantly and you have a smart plan um, but that that attitude aspect really comes into play and because of that whether you know out of my six companies half of them being non-successful the opportunities that came from the non-successful ones were the successful opportunities um, that wouldn't have been there if if I wouldn't have failed at those at those certain other ones, um, and I think that that's that's a huge that's a huge thing as an entrepreneur to get to that point where um, you're get being brought in on several projects and and uh, because of the information that you've that you've brought to the, that you bring to the table and the contacts. Um, <laughs> but with 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 Koala Tree, and if you guys have any questions to ask me, I'm kind of getting off on tangents. I didn't prepare much because I didn't know exactly what what I what topics to speak on. Um, they just kind of said, "Come tell your story." Um, but uh, moving forward, to, you know, six years later from from Koala Tree, it's been it's been a very a very fun adventure. Specifically, um, I've told several other people and other friends that are in the in the clothing industry. Um, we'll get together and say that once we're out of clothing and the apparel industry, we can do anything because um, this is a hair pulling out industry. So um, I think that, that that being said is another 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 probably the last point that I before you know if you guys have any questions, but um, is challenge challenge yourself. You know, is um, that I hate I I honestly <laughs> that's my biggest struggle. Um, my dad always pushed me out of my comfort zone growing up. He was a Finnish carpenter, and I had like massively terrible allergies if I was around dust. So he had made me come to work every summer, all summer, you know, and <laughs> have a have a head cold all summer long. Um, but he he taught me, you know, to push push the limits and get outside your comfort zone. And um, that that's another thing in business partners to look for, and in, in is to look for in relationships in general in life, but. Someone that'll challenge you, that'll frustrate you uh, in certain avenues, you know, and not to the point that that it's Ill illogical. But what what I like is having a partner that'll um, challenge me to to ask myself even why, you know, like you, you you working with a small team. I think that the more people that can challenge you and say, hey, can we do this? And it's you know, for me, I always sit back and analyze it, and then um, you know put together a game plan of like, well, we could do this, this, but this, this, and that are going to be our outcomes. Um, if you're working with somebody that doesn't understand your industry, 
um, as far as investors or partners. And then somebody that is, it's like, hey, well, um, you know, is this going to be our best, our best decision for manpower as far as outcome? Um, and I think that, that those are never questions that you want to ask because you want the easy, you know, naturally you want it to be easier and you want to be like, okay, this is, this is the easy choice, let's do this. Um, but, but you know, when I have partners that challenge myself, or so even employees, they're like, hey, we should be doing this and X, Y, and Z needs to be done today. And in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking of 20 other things that need to be done. Um, but then they draw me back to what's making us money and what's keeping the doors open um, and, and what's, the, what's the challenges that are there that are keeping, that are stopping the workflow from that happening. So I think naturally you'll be out of your comfort zone um, in any way, shape, or form, and all of them when you're starting a company. But it's, it's natural and it's good and you can harness that energy and that, that frustration towards solutions and um, you know, have, the, have the Thomas Edison mindset where you, you use frustrations um, to challenge yourself to find solutions for not just what you were looking for, but possibly for you know, 20 other problems along the way. Because you're looking for what's working and you're looking at everything as opportunity. Um, and e even when, you're, even when you're, your tests and your, and your projects are going madly wrong. Um, but I think that um, as, far as, as far as for me, you know, school was, a huge, school was a huge thing for me as far as finding out what I liked um, and, and how, how I wanted to, and what type of people I wanted to put myself around. And then jumping into the marketplace, I feel like I got really, I got really lucky here in Utah. And that's what would be my, you know, living in Colorado for four years, I was outside of Aspen in a small town of 10,000 people. And there's a ton of people I mean, in the world in general, but there's a lot of people that don't have the resources that Salt Lake does. Um, Denver doesn't. Um, you know, certainly area, the area that I lived in for four years didn't, where you have companies that are starting up all the time here. Um, it's a massive boom here for technology companies to outdoor companies. Um, there's, you know, government positions and, and, and outdoor recreation programs within the government. Um, there's so many opportunities here in Salt Lake to get involved on the ground floor with a startup company or, and see things that you never would see uh, or have an opportunity in, in a majority of America to, to get in and see. Um, and for me, I, I'm glad that I didn't take that for granted um, and, 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 you know, because n now I still have people calling me because my name's on a list of first employees of, and owners of that company and to get consulting, to, 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 to uh, still understand how they can fix some of the problems that are going on at Skull Candy, I'll still get calls from investors to ask my opinion on certain strategies since I've seen it from the beginning. Um, and, and, and that was a huge opportunity right in Park City that, that I, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of places don't have. Even in Southern California, I mean, it's hard to get into a company where you can go in and really problem solve and work with the team. Um, I think that here in Utah, it's a nice thing as well that, um, you know, there isn't as many, as many egos within the career marketplace here. Um, it's not as much competition, and, and in it, because of that, you get people that want to work together as teams and take credit at, together as teams, um, you know, and, and I like that about Utah. I think that it's a really unique place for that, and if you're, you know, if you're looking for an opportunity here, to learn and, gr and grow with the business, it's definitely out there. And that's not, that's not the case everywhere, so. All right, well thank you. <laughs>